हेलो एस्पेरेंस ऑल जी एस मेन्स ट्वेंटी वन पेपर्स आर ओवर आई हैव डन द ट्रेंड एनालिसिस ऑफ एस ए पेपर एंड जी एस पेपर वन टूडे आई विल बी डूइंग द ट्रेंड एनालिसिस ऑफ जी एस पेपर टू एंड आई कैन अंडरस्टैंड दैट मेनी ऑफ यू विल बी एक्सपेक्टिंग दैट I should deal with this particular paper in a more elaborate manner, considering uh, my own specialization is in the field of political science, international relations, and Indian government and politics. So I will also take uh, opportunity to discuss the approach to answer these questions. and uh, in the process i will uh, if possible i will try to uh, decode uh, like what type of skills besides information is required by the students and uh, one thing is like i feel uh, good about it that upsc paper has been very much in sync with my approach towards gs paper 2 i normally start my class with the constitutional morality and all the students of uh, the class know about it and uh, i was so happy to see that constitutional morality has been the very first question and anybody uh, attending uh, my gs polity class must be remembering that i always give them uh, ambedkar's book the grammar of an uh, ambedkar's speech to read because uh, that speech gives you the very insight which is needed to understand indian government and politics i believe many of the students must be feeling comfortable with the approach of the classes uh, uh, time and again i have encountered certain questions in polity that why ma'am you are discussing so many judgments but if you see the question itself the demands of the questions is judgments time and again i have on encountered that how uh, to write the questions in gs paper to differently from political science my take is always focus on the question and not whether it is a optional or gs uh, you have to have uh, more substantial thinking and uh, more uh, you can say uh, understanding and more maturity when you deal with these type of topics so uh, let me briefly discuss the trend and uh, the trend is if you see gs paper 2 at least now all of you must be agreeing that you will not be able to write answers of gs paper 2 if your study base is limited to the guide books like lakshmi kant you have to improve your level and uh, again i can say that the students of political science are going to have huge advantage because if you see international relations questions so i don't believe that any student of political science and international relations was supposed to prepare something differently fine so let us understand the trend i will say the paper was easier than the last year and a uh, lot of questions on basics one philosophy is running throughout upsc papers i have seen that now they are uh, going beyond just facts and they are trying to see whether students have that analytical skills or not fine so anyway uh, let's have a quick look on the trend what we have seen that the polity and polity questions are of 115 marks and uh, 
in 2013 when for the first time syllabus had changed that time the weightage was less 90 but after that we see uh, especially from 2018 the marks allocated to the polity and the constitution is around 115 so this is the area where you have to put the maximum focus and also because this is the major area from where the questions will be asked in prelims. Now, if you see international relations, it, the trend is static. Around 50 marks questions are being asked in international relations. So PSIR students, like if you focus on you need not to prepare anything i don't the type of the and the level of questions they ask in optional so this becomes like a cakewalk in gs paper for you and you have to understand that even with your uh, optional content you can and the theories because uh, even if it is a constitution but everything has is based on the theory and uh, the theory gives you so much conceptual clarity that you will have an upper hand in dealing with uh, these questions on polity and governance normally students are uh, more concerned about social justice and governance because there is no single book and the material is quite scattered uh, anyway the weightage is 35 and 50 and uh, this year the questions which have been asked are uh, I feel they are comfortable if you have the basics of health and other issues. So today I will be discussing the polity and governance questions. So the very first question is the constitutional morality. Constitutional morality is rooted in the constitution itself and is founded on its essential facets. Explain the doctrine of constitutional morality with the help of the relevant judicial decisions. So I'm so happy because ideally if anybody is studying polity they have to start if you are studying the constitution you have to start with understanding the constitutional morality and again see pinpointedly they have asked judicial decisions fine so please understand don't feel that in notes if you if we provide you the judicial arguments uh, this is a burden but that is actually the requirement fine so all the students or the class students you can refer the class notes on the concept of constitutional morality the cases etc but let me decode you already have this content sufficient content let me decode how to handle this particular question so the question is constitutional morality is rooted in the constitution itself so first thing is we have to establish how constitutional morality is rooted in the Indian Constitution itself. Fine. And is founded on its essential facets. So you have to understand what are the essential facets of the constitution which reflect the constitutional morality next explain the doctrine we have to explain the doctrine with the help of relevant judicial decisions with the help of relevant judicial decisions means explain means 
what all comes under constitutional morality here the key word of the question is explanation fine so how should we structure this particular answer the structure of this answer is that constitutional morality is rooted in the constitution itself so first of all i will start this answer with the very idea of having a constitution very idea of having a constitution and what is the purpose behind having the constitution so you have to understand what is constitution after all so constitution is a document which contains the system of government which contains the rights of the citizens which contains the power of government their obligation their liability fine having a constitution why do you require a particular constitution you have to understand the spirit behind having the constitution the spirit behind having the constitution is constitutionalism fine so constitutionalism is a soul for which you have created a body called constitution soul we cannot see but body we can see so constitution is a rule book but behind constitution the idea of constitutionalism is very important fine and what is the idea of the constitutionalism the idea of constitutionalism is rule of law rule of law fine and what is rule of law the rule of law is that the men in power should not be misusing the authority fine they should be using their authority for the purpose for which it has been granted fine so the rule of law means you are limiting the power of those who hold public offices and why it is so important because it is important to protect and to safeguard the rights and liberties of the people you must be knowing that lord acton has said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely fine so we have created a system we have created a social system man has created a social system and the purpose of creating a social system is to have good life and how will you have a good life when you have freedom to do what you want to do but we understand that freedom is not a license there has to be the reasonable restrictions and that is why the government comes into picture to ensure that the liberty of one does not contradict with the liberty of the other and there is a peace and harmony but it is also important that the governments or those who hold public offices they should remain within their 
limits. So first of all, we have to understand the importance of this idea itself, having a constitution and the importance of constitutionalism. So that is why now you have to see rooted in the constitution. So how, how you could have answered this particular question? You could have answered this particular question that we have created the or in modern societies you have a constitution which is a rule book for the men in power and the spirit behind having the constitution is constitutionalism so that the men in power or authority do not abuse the authority. This spirit of constitutionalism itself forms the essence of constitutional morality. What else is a constitutional morality? That itself is a constitutional morality. So the concept of constitutional morality can be interpreted in the light of this very spirit of the constitutionalism. Fine. So constitutional morality is rooted in the constitution. Understand that having a constitution, you have a constitution. Fine. But what is more important? Having the spirit of constitution. Now, what is the spirit of constitution? The spirit of constitution is constitutionalism. And constitutionalism means those who are in power, they act with the restraints. And where are these restraints? These restraints are written in the constitution. For example, if we see Article 14, Article 14 restricts the government that a state shall not deny any person equality before law. Fine. Now, this very essence of constitutionalism is nothing but the idea of constitutional morality. Fine. So, constitutional morality is rooted in the constitution. Constitutional morality is rooted in the constitution in the form of the spirit of the constitution. In the form of the spirit of the constitution, that is constitutionalism. Fine. And now you should be able to explain the concept of constitutional morality with more clarity. Fine. So what we can say that in Indian context, the concept of constitutional morality the concept of constitutional morality has been formally introduced by Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar who is known as the architect of the Indian constitution in his speech to the constituent assembly fine often famous as the grammar of anarchy speech and in this speech Ambedkar has given the reference of the concept of constitutional morality and his reference is based on where he has given reference to George Grote.
and how does George Grote describes constitutional morality? George Grote has described the constitutional morality as having reverence for the constitution which means that those who are in power they should follow the constitution not just in the word but they should also follow the constitution in the spirit understand the spirit of the constitution now the context in which ambedkar is discussing the constitutional morality is that ambedkar was fearful about the future and ambedkar has mentioned in his speech that we are entering into the life of contradictions where there is a political democracy but no social democracy and he said that india has lost independence number of times and it should not happen that we lose independence again so it is very important that we adhere to the constitutional morality democracy is just a top soil and it needs to be cultivated in india so follow the constitutional morality have a reverence for the constitution and he also said that no constitution is perfect we have created the constitution but how this constitution is going to work will depend upon those who are managing the constitution those who are holding the constitution so again and again he is trying to make those who are in power conscious that they have to follow the constitution not just in letter but also in the spirit and in india if you have to in institutionalize democracy it is very important that we observe the constitution or constitutional morality in the context george groot says that constitutional morality means having a reverence towards the constitution now what are the essential facets of the constitutional morality what are what is a constitutional morality and its essential facets fine the essential facets of the constitution and the idea of constitutional morality is based on the very vision with which we have introduced this constitution how will you draw the essential facets of the constitution and once you understand the essential facets of the constitution you can also understand the essential facets of constitutional morality in exams it is very important that you are able to communicate that you are in a position to explain all the key points which examiner wants you to explain fine so the essential facets what are the essential facets and from where are we going to find out those essential facets these essential facets are to be understood from the very purpose behind having a constitution behind having a constitution 
fine and why do we have the constitution itself fine two things you have to understand we have the constitution for two things first different constitutions the spirit may be different now what is the spirit behind having the indian constitution to establish a level playing field among the different sections of society fine because indian society has been very very unequal society hierarchical societies there has been hierarchies of caste hierarchy of class hierarchy of religion hierarchy of gender hierarchy of race and if we are coming together and going for a contract it is very important that there has to be a level playing field and that is why one of the basic structure of our constitution is equality before law so the running idea or the 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 architectonic idea in forming the constitution which shapes the essential facet of the constitution is to establish the level playing field which can also be understood through the concept of rule of law equality before law rule of law abolition of the privileges means providing every section of the society equality of opportunity to develop themselves to the maximum extent so essential facets of the constitution and the constitutional morality is based on the very vision behind the constitution and one very strong vision behind the constitution has been to establish the level playing field in the society we we have to remember what ambedkar was saying that we are entering into the life of contradictions where we have a political democracy but we do not have a social democracy fine so these ideas should be somewhere in your mind to be able to link fine and the second very purpose for having or behind the constitution is the idea of social revolution so if you see granville austin whose book is the standard book for indian government and politics or indian constitution the corner stone of a nation he says that in 1947 the political revolution was over but a social revolution had to be started many political science scholars they write about the silent revolution fine if if you you know uh, even if you are not from political science background you must have come across the public intellectuals like pratap bhanu mehta so pratap bhanu mehta what what does he tells about our constitution he says that indian constitution is unique because instead of unlike china where revolution was seen as a means to bring the change here we thought we have put so much faith on the constitution itself that through the constitution a social revolution will usher in fine so the second architectonic idea in forming the project of constitution in india is the idea of social revolution the idea of transforming a uh, traditional society into the modern society and that is why you see that time and again in newspapers etc you get to know the concept of 
transformative constitution fine so what are the two essential facets of india's constitution and constitutional morality rule of law and social transformation these are the two contexts in which we have seen that judiciary has interpreted the constitutional morality now explain the doctrine of constitutional morality with the help of the relevant judicial decisions so what we can see that in india supreme court i will see supreme i will show you that supreme court has interpreted it in two forms first in context of rule of law manoj narula case even there was a passing reference of constitutional morality in keshwanand bharati case all those who are class students i will tell them go again see the notes and understand like how how you should be going about writing such answers and what should be your approach to prepare for mains fine and the second is in terms of transformative constitutions for transformative constitutions you can give reference to supreme court's judgment in navtej singh johar case in sabri mala judgment for rule of law you can give reference to the case for example reference to the case like uh, manoj narula case delhi lg versus chief ministers case where supreme court has held that those who are in power they should go for adhering the author uh, adhering the constitutional morality so first of all when you have a look on a question try to uh, see what all information will be required in the question and then make a structure fine so how will i make a structure of this particular answer fine i will make the structure of this particular answer is that i i can have a introduction sorry fine so uh, what i am going to explain that dr ambedkar in his speech to the constituent assembly on 26th november has held that we are or in the speech of 26th november has given the reference to the constitutional morality where he interpreted the concept of constitutional morality in accordance to the idea given by george grote who described constitutional morality as a supreme reverence for the constitution and then you will say that the context in which ambedkar had given the idea of constitutional morality is his apprehension with respect to the future and he held that it should not happen that we lose the freedom again and he was very much concerned that in a country like india where social democracy does not exist how political democracy will survive so ambedkar has given the ad genuine advice to all those who are holding the position of power that they should observe the constitution by saying that there is no constitution which is 
perfect. It all depends upon the persons who are running the constitution. In thus and then link it with the root in the constitution. After giving this, then you can write that the idea of constitutional morality explain the very spirit of the constitution, the very rationale behind possessing the constitution that is to ensure the rule of law. Now Indian constitution like what is general and what is particular like all constitutions Indian constitution also aims to establish the rule of law but along with this there is another facet of Indian constitution in the sense that it is also a transformative document. Supreme Court of India has also interpreted the concepts of constitutional morality in two contexts. One in context of rule of law, for example, Delhi CM versus LG case and second in context of transformative constitutionalism in the cases like Sabrimala and Navtej Singh Johar case. And after that, you have to give the conclusion about how important it is. So it was essential to remind the elite class to observe the constitutional morality otherwise the entire experiment will go waste and we should not be forgetting that the very idea of India or India like the constitution itself is the cornerstone of nation. So if India as a nation has to survive, there is no other option but to observe the constitutional morality and that also fulfills the our you can say our obligation towards those who have uh, sacrificed their lives for the freedom for which we have this particular constitution. So have you can give some dramatic or some nice closer to this answer. Fine. You already have the notes to se aap ye sare cases jaise Keshwananda Bharti case, judgment aap le sakte. Let us move to the next question. Ye srif isle dikhaya ja raha hai so that reference you understand where in the notes it is given. Now next question, discuss the desirability of greater representation to women in the higher judiciary to ensure diversity, equity and inclusiveness. Fine. So first of all, basic thing tha ki there has been a uh, lot of references by Justice Ramanna also fine, on the representativeness of women in higher judiciary. You know that even in Pakistan, a woman is going to occupy the post of Chief Justice for the first time in the history in India also around uh, 2037 uh, or something that uh, uh, a woman will be CJI. So this, this issue has become important. Even when former CJI Bobde, he was also talking about increasing the representativeness. So it has been one of the area, one of the talking points and obviously judiciary will always be important. Now how you should have done this particular question? Discuss the desirability of greater representation to women in the higher judiciary. Higher judiciary may what is the desirability of increasing the women participation. So, aapko sabse pehle, you should understand ki bhai hum 
इतना इम्फेसिस कर क्यों रहे हैं वाई आर वी इम्फेसाइजिंग सो मच ऑन हायर जुडिशरी मीन्स देयर इज समथिंग स्पेशल अबाउट द रोल ऑफ जुडिशरी तो आपको पहली बात इम्पॉर्टेंस हम हमारा जो वेटेज है वो है कि हायर जुडिशरी में वुमेन का रिप्रेजेंटेशन बढ़ना चाहिए तो आपको पता होना चाहिए कि हमको कहाँ से ये आंसर स्टार्ट करना है तो ये आंसर आपको स्टार्ट करना है कि सबसे पहले आप हायर जुडिशरी का सिग्निफिकेंस समझते हो और उसके बाद इस बात का सिग्निफिकेंस समझते हो कि वाई डाइवर्सिटी इक्विटी और इंक्लूसिवनेस इन हायर जुडिशरी इज इम्पॉर्टेंट तो फ्रॉम वेयर आई विल स्टार्ट तो मेरा जो स्ट्रक्चर रहेगा वो सबसे पहले ऐसा कुछ रहेगा विच इस्टैब्लिश द सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ जुडिशरी इन जनरल नॉर्मली वेन एवर यू राइट द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ जुडिशरी यू कैन ऑलवेज गिव रेफरेंस टू द व्यूज ऑफ लॉर्ड ब्राइस एंड लॉर्ड ब्राइस का स्टेटमेंट जरूरी नहीं है कि ऑप्शनल है उसी में आप लिखें किसी भी अच्छे लॉ के आर्टिकल्स में किसी भी अच्छे हिंदू के आर्टिकल में डेक्किन हेरल्ड के आर्टिकल में आपको इन चीज़ों का रेफरेंस मिलता है तो ऐसी जो एडवाइस कि भाई थिंकर ना लिखिए और कोर्ट ना लिखिए ये सारी चीज़ें तो मेरी समझ के बाहर हैं और अगर आप ये लॉर्ड ब्राइस के स्टेटमेंट से स्टार्ट करेंगे तो आंसर विल बिकम वेरी ब्यूटिफुल तो क्या है लॉर्ड ब्राइस का स्टेटमेंट लॉर्ड ब्राइस स्टेटमेंट इज दैट देयर इज नो बेटर टेस्ट ऑफ द एक्सीलेंस ऑफ गवर्नेंस then the working of its judicial system so judiciary is one of the three branches but one of the most critical branches and if you want to know how well the judicial system is functioning it is to be rated on the basis of efficiency of your judicial system or the quality of your judicial system now we have to after this we have to write the importance of having a judiciary to ensure the diversity equity and inclusiveness fine fine तो इशू इज वाई देयर हैज टू बी डाइवर्सिटी इन अ जुडिशरी मीन्स वाई जुडिशरी हैज टू बी रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ठीक है सो इन पब्लिक एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन देर इज अ कॉन्सेप्ट कॉल्ड रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ब्यूरोक्रेसी इवन जुडिशरी हैज टू बी रिप्रेजेंटेटिव फाइन सो डाइवर्सिटी क्यों होनी चाहिए फाइन इंक्लूसिव बिकॉज अगर डाइवर्सिटी होगी तो ऑब्वियसली इंक्लूसिविटी भी होगी डाइवर्स मीन्स यू आर ब्रिंगिंग द लार्ज लाइक पीपल अक्रॉस द स्पेक्ट्रम तो ऑब्वियसली वो इंक्लूसिव रहेगा और ये दोनों चीजें किससे रिलेटेड हैं इक्विटी equity means justice with fairness so pehli cheez ye hai ki aap in terms ki meaning ko samajhte ho diversity equity and inclusiveness to pehle aap establish kijiye importance of judiciary the way we said that there is no better test of the excellence of a political system than how its judicial system functions after that you write how diversity 
equity and inclusiveness is a virtue. Why public institutions should reflect these virtues? Fine. So the next point, point in the answer should be to establish how diversity, equity and inclusiveness is a virtue of political institutions. Fine. In fact, the students of political science must be knowing about Aristotle. Aristotle has given the concept of polity. Polity is what? Polity is where citizens are participating, acting in concert with each other and formulating the laws as an example of the best practicable form of government. So second thing is that this is so important. Hai. Fine. So inclusiveness and diversity and equity, they are three, these are all interlinked concept. The thing is, it is a virtue of the political institutions, especially in a democratic country. In a democratic country, having a democracy itself means a system of governance which is the representative of the society where you are able to reflect the voice of the different sections of the society trying to establish a harmony in these sections of the society and more importantly if I talk about women then women comes under vulnerable section and the very idea of democracy is to give voice to voiceless. Fine. So in a democratic country it is very natural that the public institutions and then judiciary has to be representative, has to be inclusive, has to be diverse. Fine. And why? Because only such judiciary will be able to establish the legitimacy. Fine. Legitimacy of the system will be dependent on these virtues and you understand that how important is the legitimacy of the system. People should consider the system right. They should have faith. They should have a sense of belongingness. They should have a sense of being a stakeholder in the process. They should have this faith that the judgments of the judiciary are reflecting, are taking into consideration their concerns. They are not biased in favor of any specific section. If judicial decisions themselves are biased, then the very idea of justice goes and you know that if the lamp of justice goes, how big is going to be the darkness. Fine. So for the sake of legitimacy of the judicial system, it is very essential that judiciary is inclusive in terms of caste, class, gender, in terms of uh, uh, it is inclusive, reflect the diversity because when diversity comes, the biasness, the scope of biasness, gets reduced, the scope of accusations that there, there can be biasness gets and there will be greater acceptability of the judgments and there will be greater satisfaction from the functioning of judiciary. 
and if you have information then if i mention that the sustainable development goals fine related to poverty alleviation related to sustainable development protection of environment protection of environment protection of vulnerable section sustainable development goal number 16 also talks about the inclusiveness as a necessity for public institutions because only they then they can develop the sense or citizens respect and legitimacy fine so first you have to in your answer show the importance of judiciary second you have to show that why diversity equity and inclusiveness is going to be a virtue and then if you are aware of certain uh, committees and their recommendations you can mention it so recently there has been house of lords committee on judicial appointment which also mentions about the need so house of lords committee on judicial appointments in higher judiciary in britain is also has also held that in order to develop the confidence the faith it is very essential that higher judiciary has to be representative and while appointing the judges we have to go for bringing the people from different sections of the society and if you are the students of political science or you have studied in ethics that john rawls has established that justice is the first virtue of the social system and john rawls suggests that we have to provide the fair equality of opportunity fine so if our judiciary is inclusive it is like we are substantiating or we are adhering the principle of this fair equality of opportunity so at times women are not represented not just because they may not be qualified or at times merit argument is there but maybe because of living in a patriarchal society they are missing the fair equality of opportunity and fair equality of opportunity is also one of our constitutional facet one of the constitutional premise that the constitution guarantees people equality of opportunity there should not be any discrimination by the state among the citizens on the basis of gender race you can mention article 6 for 14 15 equality of opportunity in public employment and if it is not there then you have to create the institutions you have to create you have to break the glass ceilings you have to create the institutions you have to create the favorable environment because of the seriousness of the issue now after this you should be showing the sad state of affairs that our judiciary has not been inclusive in terms of gender fine and higher judiciary all the more less inclusive for example if i take the representation of women in subordinate judiciary is somewhere 20 percent but representation of women in higher judiciary for high courts you can say is, has not been more than 11 percent so nowhere in proportion to their 
population and for the first time i believe in 1989 when fatima b was like after 39 years of existence of supreme court that the first woman justice was elevated even now like till now there have been no cji who have been women this is showing the biasness fine so this biasness is not accepted in the institution like judiciary you need to bring greater there is a issue of reforms judicial reforms <coughs> and the appointment of the judges in higher judiciary is a very big issue where primarily we talk about bringing the transparency in the collegium system but along with the transparency collegium system has to ensure the constitutional ideal of providing the fair equality of opportunity to the vulnerable section for example not just women but also to the minorities to the members of dalit community and then you can say that you have established the desirability but your answer will not end with it you can write what are the obstacles why women are not present and what should be done the patriarchal mindset uh, is there then at times like the feminist studies show that women suffer a lot of disadvantages because of the gendered nature of the society even in case of uh, india uh, justice uh, chandrachur has mentioned that number of times uh, women they 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 are they are there is less number of women as a district judges or in the district courts because for women the priority becomes the family so you have to first understand the causes like why so why there is a less representation and again uh, what how we can go ahead it as a public policy government has to introduce the measures government can go for the catalysts like constitutional measures like there is a talk about uh, reservation for women in public employment so we can also talk about reservations for women in case of higher judiciary and our constitution article 15 clause 3 provides the scope where state can make special provision so the answer should include importance of judiciary one thing importance of uh inclusivity and diversity in a judiciary where the focus is inclusive public institutions generate the confidence of the people and then why women because women constitute half of the human race and we will never be able to fulfill the constitutional obligation if our judicial system remain excluded you can also talk about various benefits if judiciary is inclusive in gender terms so whether our prime minister's uh, idea about empowerment of women it is very important that women are present there it is believed that if women are the judges it becomes much uh, comfortable for the women victims fine so gender sensitization not not just representativeness it you can also give lot of ideas that we also need lot of gender sensitization if your level of knowledge is slightly uh, higher then you could have started this particular answer by the quote of a very famous uh, american uh, american uh, jurist and a radical feminist katherine mackinnon so katherine mackinnon has done lot of work in the field of judicial reforms and uh, her very famous statement is that when i look at the state it appears male to me means there is so much uh, lack of representation of women and uh, there is so much uh, dominance of men in the state structure so 
you it is up to you how you can link and don't think that only in optional you can ring these thoughts because these are public intellectuals which are known to the people across the spectrum even if you see supreme court judgments supreme court judgments do quote so many scholars so the idea is break the myths myths se bahar aao a quality answer aap likhe jo ek एक मतलब एक पढ़ा लिखा इंसान के हिसाब से आप उस आंसर को लिखें ठीक है रेस्ट ऑफ द कंटेंट यू कैन फाइंड इन योर क्लास नोट्स रिप्रेजेंटेटिवनेस ऑफ जुडिशरी 11 परसेंट ऑफ जजेस एंड ऑल फाइन सो व्हाट कैन बी डन नोट्स में आपको मिल जाएगा दीज आर द पॉइंट्स जुडिशियल डाइवर्सिटी इंडेक्स एक्सेट्रा hopefully you are understanding the importance now the third question how have the recommendations of 14th finance commission of india enabled the states to improve their fiscal position fine one of my favorite topic center and state relations and then lot of issues in the fiscal federalism so how have the recommendations of 14th finance commission enabled the states to improve their fiscal position fine so how the recommendations of 14th finance commission have improved the situation of the states so first of all you have to bring first very problem that in india what we see there is a vertical and horizontal imbalance theek hai and india is what cooperative federalism go thematically cooperative federalism is tilted towards the center and obviously what we see that even in the distribution of the fiscal power our federal system is tilted towards the center fine so states have more developmental obligations but they do not have enough resources so the constitution under article 280 provides for the finance commission fine to provide the profession formula at a professional level for the devolution of the resources for the devolution of the tax revenues etc so try to write about the uh, this particular uh, feature of finance commission after this you can say that uh, from the year 2000 onwards when uh, we see that uh, there has been a concern to address the federal imbalance and we have seen a trend where uh, from the 10th finance commission when alternative devolution scheme has been launched by which all union taxes have become divisible and subsequent finance commissions have been increasing the share of the state governments fine so in this context 14th finance commission is important because it has given the highest increase they have made the share of state from 32% in the past to 42 percent fine so increasing the share of the states means you are strengthening the federal dimension and you are creating more scope for policy choices which state governments have can make they will have more scope to have a developmental policy of their own choice after all that is the essence of federalism so what is the essence of federalism having shared rule 
as well as self rule why do we go for federalism in a country with diversity we go for federalism if i give reference to uh, dicey who has given the definition of federalism or the idea of federalism who says that federalism is a system where the units desire uniform unity without uniformity so it is very natural and it's a good thing if states have enough autonomy enough policy space and this will require that their fiscal position is stronger fine so in this sense 14th finance commission has made a very radical shift fine however you also have to highlight that 14th finance commission formula has been very significant in the sense that it has made a significant increase in the shareable amount without reducing or you can say without putting additional pressure on central government so central government has to make greater allocation but this does not mean that central government's uh, obligations or pressure has increased because it along with this it also recommends to reduce the central assistance or so called planned assistance given to the states so this 14th finance commission's recommendation where truly in the spirit of federalism what is the spirit of federalism the unity without uniformity and why do we adopt federalism because of diversity so if federal spirit is adopted in a real sense it will give lot of policy space to the states so that they can have the developmental programs of their choice and it is also uh, to be understood that there is one size fit for all formula is not appropriate so state governments according to the local needs they can go for a specific type of a programs and the beauty of the allocation of the 14 finance commission was that it did without adding additional burden because it makes a is it makes a recommendation to substantially reduce the number of the planned or centrally sponsored schemes also now uh now but the question now let us come back on the question itself and the question is saying how have the recommendations enabled the state to improve their fiscal position so in relative terms their fiscal position has improved but there has been a concern raised by the state governments and what is the concern it does not address the problem of vertical imbalance completely why because the central government has resorted to not increase what has been the concern the concern has been the question is states to improve their fiscal positions so the technical angle is 14th finance commission has increased the share from 32% to 42% it has not put additional burden because it recommended to reduce the planned assistance centrally planned assistance but the question is how much improvement has happened where they have tested your depth of understanding theek hai see governments obligations keep on increasing covid crisis has added new obligations fine 
but in terms of availability of resources again the conditions have become more or less static because central government has resorted to the approach of increasing the cess and surcharges now cess and surcharges are not shareable fine so ideally central government should have increased the rate of tax if they have increased the rate of tax it would have brought more money in the kitty of the state governments and would have improved their fiscal position but instead of increasing the rate of tax central government has resorted to this means and this is not shareable so this is a cause of concern and in effect the recommendations of 14th finance commission may have been implemented in words but they may not have been implemented in the spirit which was also very very important so this is what critically examine you have to highlight this particular fact and we have to go for a genuine fiscal federalism in the vision like our prime minister talks about sabka saath sabka vikas competitive cooperative federalism so if we want to give real shape to this we have to bring more like we have to go for not just the word but also the spirit